It is good to be worshiping with our church family here today. I wish each of you heaven's special blessings of peace, hope, and joy during this Christmas season. A brand new year lies ahead of us. And with every passing year, we are one step closer to that day when we will not only see Jesus face to face, but we will live with him and reign with him throughout the eternal ages that are before us. Just three years ago, today, the coronavirus was just a short blip in the news far from our homeland and certainly an unforeseen crisis of the magnitude that we have experienced over the last three years. If you're like most of us, by now we're so weary of even hearing that term coronavirus that many of us would like to escape into some kind of a state of denial, but sadly, it isn't over yet. I don't know about the triumphs or the tragedies that will touch our lives in the few remaining years of this year or in the year to come of 2023. But this one thing I do know, regardless of what tomorrow may bring into each of our lives, I know the end of the story and the story of the one who holds each of our tomorrows in his hand and near his heart. Christmas is now just eight days away from us and the world may go on year after year decorating tree after tree and feasting with family and friends, shopping and giving gifts and having all the colorful wrapping and the trimmings and becoming so wrapped up with the busyness of the season. But it's my heartfelt prayer that until that day when we see the face of our Savior, we will not forget to purposely take time every Christmas by spending quiet moments in reflection and gratitude as we are wrapped with wonder at how heaven bankrupted itself so that we can celebrate Christmas throughout all eternity. It was an angel who said on that first Christmas morning, Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy to a group of simple shepherds watching their flock. And 33 years later, it was an angel who assured the disciples that this same Jesus would come in like manner as they had seen him going to heaven. That's why I believe that that song that we just sang, Joy to the World, is very appropriate. Because you, you see, Isaac Watts, who wrote that song, didn't write it as a Christmas song. It's really a song about the second coming. And yet we sing it every Christmas because we have something to look forward to beyond what we celebrate this season. During World War II, when it seemed very clear that the Philippines were a doomed nation, the Allied forces decided that General Douglas MacArthur was far too valuable to the cause to be captured. So on orders from then President Franklin D. Roosevelt, he left Corregidor with his family and staff on the night of March the 11th, 1942, and set sail for Australia. Shortly after he arrived in Australia, General MacArthur made a promise. It was three simple words that he used to say, I shall return. And on October the 20th, 1944, he kept his promise and once again stepped on Philippine soil. The people of the Philippines, he said, I have returned, the general began. His hands were shaky, his voice was quivering with emotion. By the grace of God Almighty, our forces stand on Philippine soil. The hour of your redemption is near. Almost 2,000 years before MacArthur made his promise to return, Jesus made that same promise to his disciples. And many of us know that by memory, as recorded in John, the 14th chapter, 
and verses 1 to 3. We find a record of that promise in those familiar words of assurance and hope and anticipation. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Exactly 70 years ago, I was born on a little island about 30 miles off the coast of India called Ceylon, today known as Sri Lanka. I spent most of my young boyhood days there as a child of missionary parents who were serving the Seventh-day Adventist Church on that island. And um, they had just come there after graduating from Spicer Memorial College. They, they were married on that island, and I was born on that island. And as a little boy, I would count the days till Christmas Eve. I, I always looked forward. I, you know, I always wanted to know what mom and dad were going to surprise me. You know, however many years, years to follow now, long past those childhood days. As a dad, I used to look forward to Christmas somewhat differently. I didn't look at what, you know, I looked at it with a sense of anticipation, but it was almost as if that anticipation had reversed. Carol and I always tried to surprise our children with something that would make their smiles widen with excitement. But now, I look forward to seeing the expression and excitement and happiness as Carol and I watch our three granddaughters open those presents where once the joy of anticipation was what, in what I hopefully was going to receive, it's now wrapped up in the joy of what I get to give. You know, anticipation is kind of like that. It intensifies our feelings about events. Whether it may be Christmas morning, the birth of a child, the start of a new job, the celebration of a wedding day, or the move to a new place. The anticipation of the joy of Christmas morning is not something that's new. That very first Christmas, when heaven gave us its greatest gift, it was marked with a sense of anticipation that stretched out over the centuries. The people of Israel had anticipated the coming of a redeemer and a rescuer for centuries. In fact, ever since the fall of our first parents in Eden's garden, there was a longing for the promised seed of the woman described in Genesis, the third chapter, and verse 15, who would come and crush the enemy of mankind that brought us so much heartache and sorrow. It was Jacob who prophesied in Genesis, the 49th chapter, and verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And down through the ages, the promise of his coming was kept alive through the words of the prophets. For more than a thousand years, the Jewish people had waited for this event. It was on this event alone that they had rested their brightest hopes in all of their songs, in all of their prophecies, in all of their temple rites, and in all of their household prayers. They had enshrined the promise of a coming Messiah. And as time marched on, Old Testament singers and sages, prophets and priests, kings and generals spoke of the Messiah who would come and deliver God's people. They had waited and they had watched. And when an angelic messenger brought that, hum, brought that news to a humble, engaged couple in a little village called Nazareth, the time of that waiting was over. The anticipation of the coming of Christ was about to find its realization in the womb of a virgin. And that, that announcement launched Mary and Joseph into nine months of their own personal anticipation of the coming of the Son of God. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, there were two elderly people who also anticipated the birth of a king. 
One was a man and another was a woman. One had received the promise that he would personally see the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah Redeemer, in his own lifetime. The other was a widow who had spent most of the years of her life in humble service for God, always ready to respond to whatever opportunity God brought her way. One responded to the arrival of the Messiah with prophecy and with celebration. The other with witness and declaration. For Simeon and Anna, however, their anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, as intense and as strong as it had been, could never match that amazing moment when they actually saw the face of Christ. This is their story. I don't, I don't hold a candle to begin describing the qualities exemplified in a life of devotion. But I'm pretty sure that I know a life of devotion when I see one. A life of devotion demands everything. It's just who you are. In the very first Christmas story, Simeon was just such a man. Now in his advancing years, he had been a fixture at the temple for longer than anyone could possibly remember. But he kept on showing up, honoring God and waiting for that promise. His devotion was captured by Luke in only a few words, but each one is packed with such great insight. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke, the second chapter this morning. And if you have uh, your smartphone or your other devices, I invite you to open your Bibles in your, in, your, in your electronic devices to Luke, the second chapter. And we're going to take a brief look at this man of God as we find in the Gospel of Luke. You see, if it wasn't for the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we really wouldn't have much to tell for a Christmas story. Matthew is the only Gospel that records the story of the wise men. And Luke is the only gospel that records the birth of Christ the way we know it and celebrate Christmas. But after that particular moment, if you go to verse 25 of, of uh, Luke, the second chapter, we're going to take a brief description of this man of God that we find in Luke, the second chapter. We're going to pause on each one of these passages and talk about them. It says, And behold, there was a certain man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, we, we've read that passage before, and we've gone over it very, very quickly. But I'd like us to take a moment to just look at each of these points that are made by Dr. Luke in Luke, the second chapter, in verse 25. In the very first thing there that he says that he was just. This refers to a person who was upright and honorable, virtuous, uh, you know, a person who was obedient to the commandments of God. It speaks of someone who was committed to living life on God's terms instead of his own. You know, the, if you look up Strong's Concordance, it equates the word just with righteous. Then Luke says he was devout. This speaks of a person who reveres God and allows him that, that reverence to impact his life and his choices. Whereas the words just and righteous have everything to do with obeying God, one who is devout is consumed with desiring to honor God. So, he was just, he was devout, and then in verse 25 it says he was looking for the consolation of Israel. Now if you have your Bibles, you, that expression consolation of Israel refers to the Messiah. And that's why most Bibles capitalize the word consolation. You see, consolation is normally not a word that is capitalized, but here it's capitalized because while many people, and especially senior citizens, are often consumed with the past, Simeon was fixated on the future. Then it says that he was just, he was devout, he was looking for the consolation of Israel. And then he says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, friends, this is especially fascinating. 
Because until the Holy Spirit came to indwell in the believers at Pentecost, after Jesus was resurrected and, and lifted up to his Father, as we read here in, in, in Acts, the second chapter, the Spirit's role was largely in the background. But the Spirit of God filling an individual's life is unique since it was being experienced here by a man that was living prior to the cross. If someone could use a few phrases to describe who you are, what would they say about you? The description that Luke gives here of Simeon didn't have to be fabricated. It didn't have to be exaggerated. It was simple and accurate and a description of one who was faithful. One who was faithful and was characterized by a life of complete devotion to God. In the next verse, in verse 26, Luke records this, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, the Lord's Christ was the anointed one of the Lord, the Messiah, the long-awaited hope of the ages. For hundreds and hundreds of years, Jewish people, little boys and girls, mothers and fathers, grandparents, they had comforted one another with the promise of the coming Messiah. They found their strength in that promise during their difficult days. In times of national crisis, they had cried out for its fulfillment. And during the days of national prosperity, they rested quietly in that blessed assurance. And now, centuries after waiting, a signal was given. You see, Simeon's life was going to be a demarcation in history. If he died, the Messiah was going to be somewhere on the planet Earth. But the second part of this was even more mind-blowing. Simeon would not just live until the Messiah arrived. He would get to personally see the promised Messiah. And, and that promise radically affected the way that Simeon lived his life. Simeon spent his days in the temple awaiting that promise and living in anticipation of the moment that he would see the Messiah of Israel. This was the same anticipation that marked the heart and spiritual passion of hymn writer Fanny Crosby. Her eyes, though blind, saw more spiritually than most of us ever see physically. Like Simeon, she lived a life of anticipation as she longed and hoped for the time that she would get to see the King of Kings. And that passion is what prompted her to write the words of that hymn that Simeon would have truly appreciated too. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing, but oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the King. And I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. And I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. I want you to notice something here. Notice the reference to the work of the Holy Spirit here in Simeon's life. And in verse 25 of Luke, the second chapter there, the Spirit was with him. In verse 26, the next verse that we just read, the Spirit revealed the promise to him, and now beginning with verse 27, it was the Holy Spirit that was moving Simeon to the temple so that that promise could be fulfilled. You can follow either on the screen or, or in, your, in your Bibles. We're going to look at verses 27 to 32. Let's continue the narrative by reading those verses. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the Christ Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. What a fantastic scene it must have been that day. 
In the temple, as Mary and Joseph watched a completely contented man do the most meaningful thing that he would ever do in his life, celebrate the coming of the Redeemer and hold the Savior of the world in his arms. Beginning in verse 36 of that same chapter, if you'll go down a few verses and we go down to verse 36 of Luke, the second chapter there. The Gospel of Luke records about a woman named Anna. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. To discover Anna's perspective on the birth of the Son of God, we must begin to ask a simple question. Who is this lady anyway? There's only just a few verses in the Bible about her. The Scottish theologian William Barclay refers to her as one of the quiet land, purely because the scriptures give us very little information about her. But in these three verses of Luke, the second chapter, we find a fascinating snapshot of this woman. The name Anna in the New Testament is equivalent to the Old Testament Hannah, a name that means grace or favor. Anna was certainly favored by seeing the infant Christ and heralding his arrival on planet Earth. Anna's father is identified in this passage of Scripture as Phanuel. Now, that name actually means the appearance of God. It was derived from the night when Jacob wrestled with God after that experience, and he renamed the location Peniel, found in Genesis, the 32nd chapter, and verse 30. I have seen, the face, the, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. Anna is also described as being from the tribe of Asher. Now, Asher was the eighth son born to Jacob, later named Israel, and the second by Leah's handmaiden, Zilpah. And when he was born, Leah simply named him Asher, which simply means happy. Biblical historians have seen this reference to Asher as very significant because Asher has often been considered one of the lost tribes of Israel. Apparently, they were not so lost after all, for in the first century, Anna is clearly identified as a member of that tribe. Anna's life was one that was etched with great sorrow and marked with perseverance and widowed after having been married only for seven years. She was left childless, facing a life without joy and without any significance, especially in her culture. And the sorrows of her young life carried into her old age. You know, the translation of that passage by some biblical scholars say that she wasn't 84 years old, but that she was a, a widow for 84 years, making her probably somewhere around 105 years old at the scene that is being described here by Luke. What we are committed to speaks louder than anything else about who we are and what we really value. You see, folks, for Anna, it was very simple. Her priority and her ultimate goal in life was to please God. And, and although no prophets had even been heard of since the days of Malachi in the Old Testament, Anna is called a prophetess. Luke doesn't really describe the nature of her prophetic ministry or what her prophetic message was all about, but he offers an unquestioned affirmation that she was God's spokeswoman to her generation. And after 400 years of prophetic silence, God chose a humble widow with a heart for him to reopen his express will and message to the world of her day. Verse 37 tells us that she never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. 
whether she lived at the temple or always or attended the services there, she was a fixture at the house of God, and she was committed to a life of spiritual discipline with fasting and prayer. There are some critical moments in history when the right person is matched with the right event. And when that takes place, remarkable things happen. Prepared by decades of spiritual devotion, she was at the right place at the right time. If you go uh, back to Luke, the second chapter, and look at verse 38 there. It's up on the screen for you. There's an interesting phrase that's put there. It says, at that very moment or in that instant, in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him of him to all those who looked for the redemption of Jerusalem. That very moment. That instant is the critical phrase. Imagine for just a moment. What would have happened? If she decided, you know what, I'm tired. I've been hanging around this temple long enough. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. I'm tired. Think I'm going to go home and make a sandwich. I can watch the temple services on 3 a.m. of the Hope Channel. I think I'll skip church today and be in my pajamas and enjoy the church service at home. I think I'll take a day off, but it was in the temple that she saw Jesus. There was a reason why the Bible says that as his custom was, Jesus found himself in the synagogue every Sabbath day. It was in the temple that she saw Jesus. It was her faithfulness to God that positioned her in the temple at the very moment that Simeon took the Christ child from Mary's arms and lifted him up, declaring him to be Israel's long-awaited, long-hoped-for Messiah. The anticipation of the coming Messiah by Simeon and Anna as pioneer Adventists are intended to be heralds for us living today in the year 2022. As we close the chapter of this year in just a few more days and as we step into the next, are we going to remain faithful to the message that has been entrusted to us as God's end-time remnant people. God brought this church into existence for one primary purpose, to boldly proclaim the joyous message of a soon-coming Savior. I'm moved with emotion as I recall how the early pioneers of our church sang with heartfelt voices the words of that old Advent hymn, For when shall I see Jesus and reign with him above? and shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning. And from the flowing fountain drink everlasting love, and shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning. Oh, shout glory, for I shall mount above the skies when I hear the trumpet sound in that morning. That hymn was written and sung in the year of the great disappointment of 1844, a year in which people who became known as Adventists under the conviction and preaching of a Baptist minister by the name of William Miller, the Billy Graham of his time, had mistaken a 2,300-year prophecy of Daniel as the year in which Jesus would come. One fall morning, just a few years ago, Carol and I stood on the very site of those ascension rocks where those early Adventists stood up there in Lowhampton, New York, on these rocks, looking up at the sky, as our pioneers had done, homesick and longing to see the Savior's face. Carol and I stood there and we, we sang that song until then, until the day my eyes behold King Jesus, until the day God calls me home. With tears flooding our eyes and you know, we, we reflected upon the heart-wrenching sadness that they must have felt at that moment. And I submit to you this Sabbath morning that the greatest needs of our hearts here at the Charlotte Sharon Seventh-day Adventist Church is a spiritual awakening that will ignite the flames of passion and hope for that golden morning when we will see Jesus and we will behold him 
and we'll be home at last with him. In the spirit of those pioneers, will we truly remain a people captivated by the name by which we call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists for what it means, a faithful people whose anticipation is to see and to be with Jesus. God brought this church into existence for one primary purpose, to boldly proclaim the joyous message of a soon-coming Savior. From its earliest beginnings of just a handful of faithful members to, in New England to a global movement of destiny with over 21 million members and 25 million adherents who have embraced this end-time message of the three angels of Revelation 14. God has called and has guided his people, his church, in a movement of destiny that will bring us safely home to our Heavenly Father. My friends, let's, let's never become lulled into a state of complacency and say, you know, we've heard this message before. We've been talking about this forever. And let's not lose our focus on the eager anticipation that each of us holds in our heart for that grand event. My dear Sharon Church family, our Jesus will come, and he will come again very soon. Don't fall into that same trap of reasoning that was prevalent even back in the early Christian church of the apostles when Peter spoke so clearly about this very dismissive sentiment in 2 Peter, the third chapter, in verses 3 and 4, Peter said, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things just continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It's estimated that the current 2022 average life expectancy in the United States is 79.8 years. Do the math. Find the difference between your age and from that number. And now you have a little bit of an idea how close Jesus' coming is for you. In reality, his coming is as close as your last heart beats, for we are reminded again by Peter in verse 8 of chapter 3 in his second epistle. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Irrespective of the time lapse that from when I close my eyes and when I open them again, Paul assures you and me with these words of hope and promise. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 51 through 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. The prayer of my heart this Sabbath morning as I share this message with you, entitled The Anticipation of Adventism, is that we will be like the shepherds in the field who resounded with excitement and haste with those words, let us go and see this thing. May we have the commitment and passion of the three royal wise men who looked and followed that star in the east, knowing with full assurance that it would lead them to see and worship the newborn king. May we be the Simeons and Annas of Adventism, always watching and praying for the coming of our Savior. The early part of my boyhood days were spent on, with my family on the campus of this mission school called Lakpahana, which means a light on a hill. We lived in this staff house that's pictured here on the screen, across from the main school building. I don't remember this story, but my dad tells me about it. As I was behind that house that you uh, uh, saw there this, this house that you're seeing on the screen there. I, I was behind that house. I was just a little boy. And Dad always would read a passage from the Bible every morning before we started our day. And, you know, sometimes th things stick in your mind and sometimes things don't. But, you know, um, I was standing outside and silhouetted against the coconut palms behind our home. I looked up in the sky and my heart was filled with a thrill that is incomprehensible. 
Dad said, I was just so excited. I said, Dad, Dad, you've got to come see this. And you know, dads don't always respond when you call them. So dad didn't come. I said, Dad, you've got to see this. Jesus is coming. He's coming in the clouds right now. I got my dad's attention. Dad came. And when dad looked up at the sky, he put his arm around my shoulder. And he said, Son, that's not Jesus yet. He's coming, but that's not Jesus. What I was seeing is the jet fumes that were splitting the sky open across the skies. And I remember that passage from Matthew, the 24th chapter, in verse 27, that, that Dad had once read, that for as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will also the coming of the Son of Man be. I'd never seen a jet plane before. And as I saw those jet fumes highlighted by the sunlight of that early sunrise morning, I was thinking, this was it. A few years later, it was Christmas morning on 19, 1961 on the island there, just about where I was uh, on these steps of this home. At that particular time where we were living in this house, it was the last house that we lived in together as a family. We were on those red steps there. In 2014, Carol and I had the opportunity of going to those very steps and seeing those steps again. We were sitting there, and my dad was pastoring two churches while my mom served as the district church school teacher in a classroom, a one-room school right behind this house. I was just nine years old when my parents had talked about going to the United States for a few years and then returning back to India where my dad had hoped to come back after he finished his master's degree with hopes to find a teaching position at Spicer Memorial College. We were not coming to the United States to stay. How unpredictable life can be, and for that, Carol is ever grateful. Just one week from now, we get to celebrate our 49th wedding anniversary, and I'm thankful for how God directed our lives. Yes, I got married when I was 10 years old, so... The only way, however, for this to be possible, and this is what Dad revealed to us, was that he would have to come or go ahead of the rest of the family and raise the money and eventually bring my mother and the three of us. Lorraine, my sister, my baby brother Lester, and myself. And although I was just a young boy at that time, I remember what a sad Christmas that was. I don't think I fully realized the awful impact that it would have on our family to be separated for that long. Although we shed a lot of tears on that Christmas day in 1961, Dad and Mom contemplated this major decision. And before Dad could even get a student visa to come to the United States, he'd have to work in England for the Adventist Stanborough Press, and then he'd go to the United States and get situated as a student a full-time student with two full-time jobs to raise the money so that the rest of his family could come and join him. This was going to be our last picture together as a family before the ship that held my dad pulled away from our island home in Colombo Harbor Port on that April day of 1962. And the days passed into months and months passed into years and in my, in my boyish thinking, the time seemed like an eternity. We had no phones back then. The campus of our mission school did not receive international calls, and the Internet was unheard of, and for almost three years, the only communication that we had was in the regular air grams that Dad was able to afford sending every single week and the packages of gifts that occasionally came for us on birthdays and Christmases from America. Finally, the big day came when my mother came back home from a trip to the American embassy in the capital city of Colombo and told us with a smile on her face she had our tickets, she had our visas. It was time to pack up. It was time to say goodbye. It was time 
to see that again. Just as this book is a reminder constantly of the letters of God that one day we will be together again. Dad's letters were a reminder that he'd never forgotten it, that one day we'd be together again. I remember sitting in the cafeteria of our mission school and being deeply moved as the entire school gathered around my mom and my sister and my brother and I. And they sang a song saying, God be with you till we meet again. And the next morning, as all the students and teachers waved from the front of this administration building that you see pictured here, we bade farewell to our island home. But the sadness of parting with friends and classmates was only overcome with one glorious longing, and the longing to see my dad's face again. It was this ship, the SS Fair Sky, that would take us across the ocean thousands of miles to England as I looked forward to that moment when I would see my dad's face again. And I, I still have a postcard that I keep very close uh, to me that I wrote my dad, actually, and it was dated in, on July 1964 that read, My dearest daddy, here we are on the most happiest journey of our lives. For you English teachers, that's a double superlative. It seemed that it took forever to cross that wide chasm of sea that lay between Ceylon and the United States. Our travel took us by sea to England, and then from London we boarded our transatlantic flight to New York by an Alitalia jet, and then from New York the final flight to Washington, D.C. by an Eastern Airlines four-prop plane where I would see my dad again. Finally, after almost three years, we were together again as a family. No more sea. No more separation. Eight years ago, we celebrated Mom and Dad's 65th and their last wedding anniversary until my mom fell asleep in 2015 and my dad passed to his rest in 2019. In Revelation, the 21st chapter in verse 1, John penned these words, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Someday, very soon, I will behold him face to face in all of his glory. That is the anticipation of this Advent season. The promise is absolutely sure to every one of you seated here on this Sabbath morning. Hebrews, the 10th chapter and verse 37, reassures us with these words of hope. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Yes, the comforting words of that angel on the Mount of Olives, this same Jesus shall so come will be the longing and song of my heart. Yes, this same Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, it will be the same Jesus, unchanged by the changing years. I will know him by the smile that I see on his face when he sees me. I will know him by the melody in his voice when he welcomes me home. I will know him by the embrace that he will give me, touched by hands that bore the cruel marks of nails because of my sin. In the closing words of the book of Revelation, by the beloved apostle John, with whom I hope to share the joyous realms of all eternity, even so, Come, Lord Jesus.